So last week we started this new teaching series called Created on Purpose. And really the big idea behind the entire series is this idea of identity. That is, is there a central human identity? And if so, what is it? And then what does it mean for us to live it out? And identity is an issue that's up for grabs in all kinds of ways in our world today. Uh, But the Bible speaks very clearly to it. Uh, that God has a, <clears throat> excuse me, a creational intention, a creational ideal uh, for humanity. And so last week we started in a very foundational way, in the very beginning of the book of Genesis, reminding ourselves that we are created by God. We suggested a couple of things that were implications of that. The first is that that creation is intentional. It didn't happen by chance. It was not a surprise. It was purposeful and intentional. And the second reality is that it was distinctive. That the creation of humanity is distinctive from other aspects of creation. Uh, The way that it is spoken of is created in the image of God. And we have to reckon with what that means. And then lastly, we talked about the idea that the creation of humanity is an act of craftsmanship. That God has uniquely crafted it in a beautiful and perfect way all ending in our conclusion that humanity, every single human person, has value and dignity because they're created in the image of God. And we also began to suggest that if we are created by God, then it logically follows that our Creator gets to define our purpose. That the Creator, the One who crafted and created it, gets to define our purpose. Because we, if you remember, suggested that God didn't just create humanity and then release it to go do whatever it wanted or for uh, some other owner to take ownership over it and repurpose it in some way. But God still has a claim on all of creation and therefore we need to understand what is His purpose for us as humanity because if we can come into alignment with that, we'll find true inner harmony and peace an actual joy that comes from it. So that's where we pick up the story this morning uh, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, if you have a copy of the Scriptures. My Bible has fallen apart this morning. You don't need the table of weights and measures to preach a sermon, I don't think, so we should be okay. Genesis 1, verse 27. This is what it says. So God created mankind in His own image. In His image, God created them. Male and female, He created them. Right? You don't have to be a great literature scholar to understand the value of repetition in that verse. He created them. He created them. He created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They'll be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God God saw all that He had made and it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. The Word of God for the people of God. I'll take my Bible pieces and put them over here. So I want to suggest to you this morning that we can summarize that text with three statements of purpose for humanity. Three very basic statements of purpose, and we'll attempt to tease them out just a little bit. And then my hope is that over the course of the next days and weeks, you'll begin to really think through, okay, then what are the implications of this for my life? The first statement of purpose that we have from God is to fill the earth. What on earth does that mean? We'll talk about that in a second. The second statement of purpose that we have from God is to subdue creation. What does that mean? And the third statement of purpose is not overtly stated there, but it is implied in all of it. And that's what I would suggest, that we are called to enjoy creation with our Creator. So there we have it. Fill 
subdue, enjoy. What does it mean to fill the earth? Well, at a very basic level, we can think about, well, lots and lots of people go all the way to the corners of the earth. This is God's intention. And you would be absolutely correct in understanding that. But there's more to it than just that. And for us to really understand this, we have to think in terms of the context of the earliest civilizations. What's called the ancient Near East, uh, ancient Mesopotamia, and all the civilizations around it had very basic understandings to them that very much informed uh, the Israelites in their understanding of the world. One of the tenets or realities in the ancient Near East was that there was a such thing as being created in the image of God, but it was not universal over all of humanity. Rather, it was only the king who was created in the image of God. The king could only be in one place at one time, and he was the image bearer of God. He was the ruler and, and, and had dominion over all of the places. So what they would then do over a course of a massive empire to extend his rule and his power is they would build statues. Something like this. There we go. So this is the statue of a king, uh, one of the kings of Assyria. They think maybe in... The 10th century B.C., not exactly sure, was found in the late 19th century. Um, but it was not found in the ruling city, the city from which uh, the Assyrians would have ruled, Nineveh, probably in those days. But it was found in a, somewhere in modern-day Iraq, somewhere farther away from that. And this is significant because we know through archaeology and history that statues like this of kings were found all over the empire, not so much in the city where the king himself was. Now, there's a particular reason for this, and that is that they wanted the people in the empire to have regular interaction with the presence of the king, even though the king was not going to be in those places. So what do you do? You build a statue of the king so that every time it's seen by the citizens of the empire or the people who have been conquered, they're reminded of who rules, who reigns, and who is the one who is in the image of God? It's a statement of dominion, a statement of authority, as it were. This becomes prolific even up in, until and through the Roman Empire where you have statues of Caesar, right? whichever Caesar is in charge at that time, all throughout the empire for the exact same reason. With this as a background, let's think through this idea of filling the earth. Could it be that you and I are called to be statues of the true empire, of true emperor all throughout the empire? This is actually the imagery that the ancient writer is using when he's composing this through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. It's not just that there be human beings everywhere. <laughs> it's that in their presence in those places, when any part of creation looks upon them, they would be reminded of the one who is the true, true authority, the one who is the true ruler, who has the true dominion, the true power, and claim over all of that place. This is what it means to fill the earth. This is what it means to fill Bethlehem, or Allentown, or West Bethlehem, or Nazareth, or Coopersburg, or Emmaus, or whatever part you, of place you are playing. You literally, providentially, have been placed by God in that place to fulfill this divine purpose from the very origins of creation. So if that's true, how on earth do we do this? And in the text, it gives us two clues, doesn't it? It says, be fruitful and multiply. Now, we read those verses and we think immediately of having babies, right? Babies who have babies who have babies who have babies who have babies. That's how we'll fill the earth. Fair enough. That's probably an implication of this text. But there's more to it than that, especially post-fall in Genesis chapter 3 where we're thinking about what it means to bear God's image in the world in the midst of corruption and sin and brokenness everywhere it is. The idea then to be fruitful wrapped up in the idea of being a statue or a bearer of the image of God in all parts of the kingdom of God, 
I would say to you, actually has the meaning of doing the job, right? To be fruit. What does a tree, how does a tree do its job? It's fruitful. How does a representative of the king in various parts of the empire do its job? It represents the king. That is that in our whole way of living and how we orient our lives and the decisions we make and our responses to the realities of our world and even the brokenness of our world, we're actually testifying to the character of God, not our personal inclinations. Does that make sense? See, while a statue could not speak, it could be a fair representation of the image of a king. While we are freely able to speak, oftentimes we fail to be a true representation of the image of a king. Does that make sense? At the very core level, to be fruitful means to do the job, to bear the image to call people to reckon with the truth that, oh, there is a Creator. There is a God. He does have dominion over everything. And I'm coming into contact with it through the way in which this person, my neighbor, my co-worker, my colleague, the parent of my child's friend, how they orient their life, how they're responding to the things in this world. That's what it means to be fruitful. But then it does say to multiply, doesn't it? <laughs> and again, certainly having kids and having families and all of that can be part of this. But there is a such thing as multiplying for no good reason too, isn't there? Right? At some level, that is the mission statement of cancer. right? A quickly multiplying thing that's actually broken and, and causes harm. What God's talking about here is multiplying for the blessing and benefit of creation. So far more than just having offspring to have offspring's sake, what he's actually talking about here is bringing human beings into the fullness of this identity and then multiplying yourself in that identity so that there are more and more statues throughout the empire. Does that make sense? So there's not just a statue in West Bethlehem, there's also one in Bethlehem Township. So there's not just a statue on your street, but there's also a statue a couple streets down. So there's not just one statue on your street, but eight statues. How much more uh, dominion and power would that assert for the empire? This day, that even in our lives, even in real physical reproduction of the human species, what ultimately is being talked about here is instilling in every human being a restored identity of what it means to be human in God's image, for God's purpose. We do that with our kids if we're blessed with them. Hopefully, hopefully that is your chief objective as a parent. I've talked about that ad nauseum. I won't talk about it anymore. But even more so in our broken world, it's speaking truth and, and living truth into those around us in a reproductive way so that people are reconnected to relationship with God and therefore their divine purpose. Human objective number one, fill the earth. The second thing that he says, this gets a little more interesting, is rule over creation. Now, if you're anything like me, this gets a little bit exciting, doesn't it? Ooh, rule over creation. There's a lot about creation I'd like to rule over. In fact, there's a lot about creation I would like to bulldoze, right? We'll start with all the birds of the air. We'll get rid of all of them. We don't need any of them anymore. If you're new, I apologize. Birds and I have a, a love-hate relationship. They love to annoy me, and I hate them for it. <laughs> Alas. What is fascinating here is what God is calling us to do is to rule as He rules, not rule as we see fit. Does this make sense? What's going on here is, I think this becomes challenging, because maybe you're like me, when you think about creation, when you think about what's happening in Genesis 1 or 2, however it's working out historically and all those things, we almost think that God speaks into existence pristine creation everywhere, right? Like, perfectly cut lawn. Not too low, but not too high, right? Just like my neighbor who gets it right every time. 
you know, perfectly manicured bushes, perfectly everything. But that's not the imagery of Genesis 1 and 2, actually. The imagery of Genesis 1 and 2 is of God who takes chaos and brings it back into order and then gives humanity the role of cultivating, taming, tending to it, curating it almost like a museum so that it can come into its full glory. We've actually been given responsibility in it. It's not a finished product even though it already is perfect in God's creation. Does that make sense? That God, for whatever reason, then and now, has decided that He intends to work on His creation through His creation. This is theologically significant for us. So what does it mean to rule over creation then? I've been using the word rule, haven't I? Subdue is actually the word, right? How do we subdue? We rule, right? So we rule over creation. God has actually given us a, a, a command, almost like uh, theologians would call it like a vice regent, right? Like uh, we're, uh, we've been commissioned with authority even though we're not the one with the actual authority in order that we can rule over that. So we can think about that in very real ways. Very real ways like government, right? Uh, you, you, we all probably have a love-hate relationship with government too. But this idea which even in human government, God has been involved with it from the beginning because it's a way to rule over creation. And while perhaps none of us might aspire to political office or currently hold some kind of political office, many, if not most of us, have some form of leadership or authority in this world. Some kind of vocational authority. Perhaps you're over some people at work. Uh, some kind of familial authority. Perhaps you're a parent uh, of a family some kind of, of relational authority in terms of friend group that you might help provide some leadership over. Uh, there's so many different ways in which to see this. And God's continuous call on us that to live into this idea of subduing creation is to rule as He would rule. Right? To, to, to bring and to, and to lead in such a way that it, that it moves towards the glory of God and enabling creation to become all it is intended to be, not what I would like it to be. Or, worse yet, for most of us, not using it to accomplish, for me, uh, better realities. There's a second word that gets used, not in, in Genesis chapter 1, but in Genesis chapter 2. If you're, if you're familiar with the creation story, you know, in Genesis chapter 1, there's this overarching statement of creation. In Genesis chapter 2, uh, the, the story of the creation of humanity is retold in more specifics. And there's a word that's used in Genesis chapter 2 that I think is helpful in understanding this idea of subdue. Genesis 2.15 says this, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. A better translation of take care of it is to cultivate. I want to suggest to you the second way that we subdue the earth is that we cultivate creation. Someone has said it this way, that every single person is actually a culture creator. No matter your status in life or your position, that every single one of us <clears throat> is exerting influence into culture. That we are all cultivators of this creation around us in one way, shape, or form. And whether we are intentional about it or not, we are cultivating. And so the reality here would be to be intentional about cultivating. And in the same way, God gives us authority to rule, but He intends for us to rule as He would rule. Here He gives us authority to cultivate, but He intends for us to cultivate as He would cultivate. Now, this language is necessarily agricultural. That makes all kinds of sense in an analogy here. But it also made all kinds of sense in that world and in that time because that was most of the way that life was lived. But it helps us understand at a broad level this idea of cultivating creation, tending to it, caring for it so that it can produce its bounty, not just 
for personal gain. What does it mean to cultivate like God cultivates? Let me give you an example. Uh, th- three or so years ago, uh, Rachel and I bought a new house and we moved into it. Uh, and it was a great blessing from God uh, and we're so grateful for it. And the previous owner of the home who had lived there, I think from its beginning, had cultivated a massive amount of um, plants and shrubs and gardens and trees and all of these things. I mean, really beautiful. Uh, He probably shed tears when he talked to me for a few minutes realizing who he was turning the keys of this house (laughs) over to and how this might work out. And so over the last three years, Rachel and I have engaged in hours upon hours upon hours of attempting to tend to this massive horticultural mess, if you use my language, right? And I remember one night I sat down with Rachel and we were sitting there talking and I said, you know, Rachel, I have a plan for the backyard. She got her ears perked up. She's excited. She likes to work in the yard. She said, what's your plan? I said, we remove 80% of the shrubs and we plant plant grass, right? And and she said, why? And I said, because I have the capacity to care for about 20% of these plants and I know how to cut grass. I know I can do that. And then everything will be fine. And of course, Rachel had very different plans for the backyard and the front yard, which included not so much the removal of these things, but the giving of more time and more effort to the curating of it. And neither of our plans necessarily aligned with Frank, the previous homeowner's plans. Here's what I am getting at in all of this. Most of us live our lives on a a singular level of what works for me. The idea of cultivating creation, God is actually calling us to a higher level of thinking that says, how do I live in cooperation with this created world in such a way that I bring into it the fullness of what God has intended. Listen, I'm not just talking about trees and plants and shrubs and and nature. I'm talking about everything that creation means in its language. What would it mean for us to actually take up that kind of vocation on our life? To think broadly like that instead of, how do I make this work for me, this life work for me? but how do I cause all that's around me to flourish as I flourish in creation? One of the chief ways that we cultivate creation is through our work. Now, I don't have lots of time here. I'm sure to do this in like five minutes, but uh, what I'm going to do in five minutes, it took two sermons to preach a couple of years ago. So I I would encourage you to, to listen to it more deeply. Because I do think, as Americans, we have an unhealthy relationship with work. But here's what we need to know. That work has always been part of God's plan for humanity. We can't get past it. It's right here in the beginnings, and after it's all written, God uses words like, and this is very good. Right? God's view of work is that it is very good. We need to reckon with that and figure out what that means, and rectify our relationship with work. For most of us, we either see work as as a, 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 uh, a burden that is around us that we have to do in order to get the things we need for life, or on the far other side of an unhealthy relationship with work, we see work as the means by which we can accomplish an identity through our performance, productivity, amassing of resources, whatever it is. Both are equally unhealthy. The biblical view of work is actually to cultivate creation through our work. Martin Luther understood this, the great reformer. He actually said that there's dignity in every single kind of work. No one piece of work is better than the other. Think about that for a minute. Oftentimes through our Christian worldview, right, which is a good thing to have, we misinterpret work in a tiered system, don't we? It is, well, those who are called to be missionaries, that's the most important work. And then, those who are called to be pastors or Christian vocational ministry, that's really important work. And then there's the rest of it, right? And we might say, well, doctors, like they help people get better. Teachers, they help. Like, we tear it down like that. 
that's actually an incredibly unbiblical way to look at work. God's view of work is that every single aspect of work is significant, it's dignified, and it's necessary. Martin Luther understood this. He said that in our work, we are, quote, the fingers of God. Love it, right? Because Luther understood it this way, that the chief means by which God delivers on His promises to protect, care for, and love His creation is through His creation. And a chief means of doing that is through our work. You can look at your work as something you do to get money, to pay the bills, and have the fun that you want to have. That's part of the equation. Let's just be honest with it. There's a utilitarian nature to work. However, what if we began to realign our concept of work, our theology of vocation, with God's intention for us? That in whatever you do, You're called to actually do it in a way that cultivates creation, that helps deliver upon the promises of God for His people. That will change not only how you think about your work, but actually how you do your work. It'll change the character that you develop in and through your work. It might change the motivations you have at work. If you have authority at work, it will help you change the culture of your workplace. This is all incredibly significant stuff. Work at its core is not utilitarian. Can I say some direct truth to you this morning? The Christian uh, theology of work is not this, right? Well, I go to work for two reasons. One, so I get money and I can give some to the church. We're grateful for your donations to support this ministry. That's not why you work. Okay, fine. Well, I go to work so that I can share the gospel with my, with my coworkers. That's my whole reason for being there. We hope that you do. That's part of what it means. But we hope that you're sharing the gospel with everyone you're in contact with. That's not the purpose of your work. The purpose of your work is part of what it means to be human. What if you saw it as cultivating creation and or helping to rule over creation? There is dignity and beauty and glory in all kinds of work that is fully given to God in this way. And Christians could have powerful testimony in how they conduct themselves, let alone what they say, if they orient their work in this way. It's really significant. Last thing. Last call that we have as human beings. Last purpose that God gives us is to enjoy creation. Now I said already, it is not explicitly stated here, yet it is directly implied. Why? Because we see it directly from God. And if we are image bearers of God, we're meant to have the same kind of character that He has. God looks at all His creation and He stops after the sixth day and He rests. Why? Because He's tired? I don't think that fits with our theology of God, right? We would say that God is omnipotent. He has all the power and strength in the world that He needs. He doesn't rest because He's tired. He rests because he says it's very good and he intends to enjoy it. That God is fully engaged with creation or at least intends post-fall to be fully engaged with creation in relational and connected ways. The imagery of the garden before the fall is an imagery of of a God who walks freely amongst His creation. Unhindered. Unrestricted. Not self-limited. Not feared in, a, in a, a judgment kind of way. That's the ideal of creation. Could you imagine if we lived in that kind of reality where the Creator of the universe just walked freely among us in the beauty of it? This is what we're meant to cultivate. Because of Jesus... We have the opportunity to live lives where God walks freely where we are. Does that make sense? Like, listen, God is not restrained, right? If He wants to be somewhere, He's going to be somewhere. But because of brokenness and sinfulness, His holiness, they, they can't coincide. But through Christ, that has been dealt with. And so, if, if we're in union with Jesus, where we go, we, we bring the freedom of God with us. Here's the thing. I think 
even the most committed Christians still restrict God from freely walking in their lives. God, I'll take you over here. I'd like you here. I'll have you over here. But this spot over here, that's mine. (laughs) Right? And in classic ways, well, God, I'll take you on Sunday morning. I'll take you at community group. But when I go to work, I I got business to do. (laughs) Right? And I'm not talking about like being so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good, or living in this weird spiritual bubble where all you're doing is you have your nose in your Bible walking around not engaging with everyone. I'm talking about the intentional cultivating of relationship with God in all of life. What would it mean for God to walk freely in your life? Would you give Him that kind of permission? Listen, not that He needs it, but your love for Him is what He's looking for that invites it. And then what if we not only cultivated that kind of relationship with God, but we lived within creation in such a way as to enjoy it. Now, we misunderstand what the word enjoy means all too often, don't we? Right? We tend to think of it in, um, in self-absorbed ways. Right? Oh, to enjoy creation means I'm going to squeeze everything out of it that I can that's good for me. <laughs> that's not enjoying creation. That's abusing it. Right? What would it mean to actually live in harmony with each other? You know, a place where we actually loved and blessed each other, not tried to use each other for our own ends or for our own goods. That we weren't stacking up people to support our aims and goals, but we actually were living in a blessing and loving continual relationship with everyone that we came into. This is what Jesus talks about, right? That's oh, great that you love your neighbor. What about your enemy? <laughs> this is hard truth for sure, but this is what we're called to. And then what if we looked at the whole of creation, right? I'm not just talking about environmentalism, but the whole of creation. What if we looked at it as something we were meant to naturally be connected to, not simply to use for ourselves? I think we would find in those three things true inner peace and joy that God created us for. A dynamic and unrestricted relationship with our Creator that enables a loving and blessing instead of violent and small and big ways to the rest of humanity that embraces the cultivating of all of creation for the glory of God. There's a creed in the church. Uh, It's the first statement of what's called the Westminster Shorter Catechism. It asks questions and it answers it. Question, what is the chief end of man? That is, what is our purpose? Answer, to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. This is what I've just tried to say. How do we glorify God? By filling the earth. Embodying His character wherever we are. So then when people look at us, yes, they see us in our uniqueness. That's how God intended us. But ultimately, their eyes are lifted to a Creator who has actual final authority in this world. And we subdue the earth. We're cultivators and, 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 and rulers. Not crushing, not, not moving to build something for our own gain, but cultivating all of creation to sing in unison the very first song that we sang, all creatures of our God and King. Lift up your voice and with us sing. Hallelujah. Alleluia. Oh, praise Him. Alleluia. That is the purpose of creation. That is the purpose of our creation. That is what it means to be truly human. You say, but, but could you give us an example? Yes, I can. His name is Jesus. If you want to know what it looks like to be truly human, to be human as we were created to be, read the Gospels. I'm not suggesting to you you're going to go out and do the miracles. Fair enough, right? But how did He interact with people? What did His relationship with the Father look like? 
How did He care for creation? All of these things speak into our ultimate purpose. Because when we do it, we bring glory to God. We fill the earth with the glory of God just as we were intended to. Here's what I'm suggesting to you, church. You have a clear call. It is inescapable. We have a purpose statement, a job description. Does that ever get you in trouble at work? Right? The boss calls you into the office and says, uh, let's pull out your job description here for a minute. Typically that means something's off or they're going to add things to your responsibility. In Genesis 1 and 2, we have a job description. And we would do well to live into that reality. Or as the Apostle Paul, one of the first preachers of the Gospel who helped write parts of the New Testament, which were letters to churches encouraging them to live into their identity. And we remember from last week that he was deeply concerned with us understanding our creational identity. This is how he wrote it to the church at Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. He says, As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you, parakaleo, to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. You have a calling. Your charge is to live worthy of it. What would that look like in all aspects of your life? Do you pray with me? God, thank You for these stories of origin. (laughs) Thank You that while all too often we get caught up in logistics and specifics and questions of science and history, which are, are valid and important to consider, what is clear is what it means to be human and what You've intended of us. Now, as is common in Scripture, Lord, You do not give us specifics. (laughs) There is no uh, letter from Paul to Adam Eshbah with six chapters telling me just what to do. Instead, by the power of Your Spirit, You're asking me to think through my life. And on the basis of this identity, begin to orient my life in ways that make sense to bring glory to to my Creator. So Holy Spirit, would You do just that for each and every one of us? We ask that You would give it to us in ways we can understand and at a pace that we are capable of processing. (laughs) And might we be people who are fruitful, who do the thing, who hear the call, and who live worthy. We ask it in Your name. Amen.